or online, I want to thank you for taking part of your weekend to spend a little time with us. You can let us know you're here today by either filling out the flap on your bulletin and dropping it in the offering basket when it goes by later in the service, or by filling out the online connect card at trinityruston.org slash hub. If this is your first time visiting Trinity, we especially want to thank you for being here. So before you leave this morning, stop by the information table to get a free gift. You can find everything you need to know about what's happening around here by visiting the Trinity Hub at trinityruston.org. But right now, I'd like to take just a few minutes to share a few of the great things coming up soon at Trinity. This year, Vacation Bible School will take place in the Jerusalem Marketplace. Your kids will be able to hear, see, touch, and taste what it might have been like to live during Bible times. They'll also learn important truths about Jesus and what he did for each and every one of us. VBS kickoff will be on Sunday, June 5th at 9 a.m. in the Children's Wing, and then we'll close out with the Family VBS Night on Wednesday the 8th at 5.30 to show you all the great things our kids learned over the last few days. So get your kids signed up today and get ready to step back in time to where Jesus walked. The school year may be coming to a close, but that doesn't mean that there's not still plenty of ways for you to continue learning and developing in your faith. First up is part three of our Genesis Bible study, which begins this evening at 5 p.m. in the Trinity Center. Over the next seven weeks, Becky Clark and Marie Burns will be covering the life of Isaac and the beginnings of Jacob's story. Then on Thursday, June 2nd at 9.30, our women's ministry will begin Priscilla Shire's seven-week study on the book of Jonah. To find out more about these and other great Bible studies happening at Trinity, visit the Trinity Hub. The Trinity Run for God group has teamed up with the Weekend of the Cross Committee to host our very first 5K and 10K race right here at Trinity. Whether you like to run or not, this is a great opportunity to support the work that happens in our community during Weekend of the Cross. Race day is June 25th at 7.30 a.m., and the course will take you down the north end of the beautiful Rock Island Greenway. Information on how to sign up and donate is on the Trinity Hub. The price increases on June 1st, so sign up today to get the best price and show your support for an amazing weekend. Thanks again for joining us today. We know that God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel His love in a new and fresh way. Remember to stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook, Instagram, and at our website, trinityruston.org. And I'd also like to encourage you to invite someone new to come to church with you. Your invitation just might be the spark that makes a lasting impact on somebody's life. So have a great week, and when you come back, bring a friend. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you in God's house this morning. Um, it's good to be back from vacation. Tamara and I went to the beach, and we did the beach the way people like us should be the, do the beach. Fourth floor of the condominium did not go outside. We looked at the beach. It was wonderful. Didn't have to deal with the sand, but it's good to be back home. Let us pray. In this time of worship, we welcome you, O God. We welcome you, O Christ. We welcome you, O Holy Spirit. Turn our minds unto you so that we may understand the true meaning of life. Turn our hearts unto you so that we may be able to abide in your love and your love may flow through us. Turn our wills into your word so that you may guide us into all truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For the hymn of praise, the affirmation of faith, and the glory of Patre, would you stand?
in standing and join with us as we affirm our faith by reciting together the historic Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Amen and amen. May we go to God together in prayer. Almighty God, too often when we come to you to pray, we bring a list. Lord, you know what we need. You see what we need. This day and this moment, may we set aside our list and may we simply open our hearts and our lives to who you are. Our prayer this morning is that you would speak to us. Our prayer is that you would be our God and that we would be your people. So Lord, may we hear from you today in our need, in our celebration, in our confusion, in every way we find ourselves. May we hear from you, may we follow you, may we seek you, and may we find you. Lord, we do join together in faith joining our hearts as we join our voices in praying the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As our ushers come forward, we prepare to continue our worship through our giving. Let me remind you that you can leave your gifts in the offering plates, or you can give digitally via the Trinity Hub or text to give. May we pray. Gracious God, you bless us in abundance. And in these moments, we return just a portion of that blessing back to you to be used for your kingdom. So we pray your blessing on what is given and on those that give. For the sake of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
seated. Our lesson this morning comes from the third chapter of John's Gospel, starting with the 16th verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that anyone who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe and are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all those who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I admit I'm going to miss Chris when he's gone. We have scintillating conversations up here during church. Yes, we do. I'm trying to explain to him Methodist hymnody, that some of those hymns were written a long, long time ago, way back in the 1970s. He just doesn't understand. One Sunday not too long ago, the choir was doing one of their great anthems, and Chris and I were sitting there listening to the great anthems, and Deborah was playing away on the piano, and there was a moment, we both heard it, but he leaned over to me and said, does that piano riff sound like cold plays clocks? And I thought, some of you are going to have to look up cold play, and you're going to have to look up clocks. And I thought, yeah, it sounds a little bit like it. So I'm going to miss the conversations we have, particularly about worship. I'm going to miss Chris as a colleague in ministry. We pass each other in the Methodist church, and it seems our paths always kind of circle around to each other. In 1983, I was appointed to a church in New Orleans as the associate pastor One fellow you may have heard of, Burl Moreland, was the senior pastor of that church. Years later, when Burl retired from Trinity, I hired him to be an associate pastor with me at a church in Baton Rouge. Our incoming district superintendent, Tom Dolph, was one of my associate pastors at the same church in Baton Rouge. It's a small fraternity of men and women who serve in the Louisiana Annual Conference. And when one of them dies, it affects you. This week, I read and and the news was uh, shared that Reverend Stephen Kelly had passed away. Steve grew up in the Aurora Church in New Orleans. And I knew Steve and Janie from long ago. And it makes me reflect on life and ministry when these people of my age pass on. It makes me know that I'm not going to live forever myself. Steve was a great guy. He was one of those lively Methodist ministers. I remember when he came home once from Centenary College, his dad walked me out to the street beside the church and said, Doug, I want you to look in Steve's trunk. And I popped open the trunk of this very old Buick Electra 225. I mean, the trunk was as big as this altar area. And I popped it open, and there was every beer ever invented and sold in Shreveport, Louisiana. Doug, he said, this is how my son has been studying for the ministry. I said, Joe, he'll be well qualified when he gets there. He'll know a lot about sin. 
Joe Kelly just shook his, shook his head. Joe Kelly, Steve's dad, was a great man in Methodism. Joe had served in World War II. Joe had gone on to become an engineer. And Joe had made his fortune. Joe Kelly in his lifetime made more money than was humanly possible to make, and he'd saved every dollar of it. He retired, got bored at sitting at home, and went to work again and made his second fortune. Joe Kelly was one of those Methodists that would call the bishop and say, Bishop, I want a new preacher. And the bishop would give Joe Kelly and the Aurora Church a new preacher. Joe would come in almost on a weekly basis, and he had two questions he would ask the ministers. You had to have the right answers to Joe's two questions. He said, do you remember where you came from? That was Joe Kelly's way of saying, Bubba, you don't need to get too cocky. I know where you came from. And you need to honor your roots and honor the people that raised you. You need to live as a humble individual. Not too proud, but not too lowly either. Do you remember where you came from? And then he would ask, do you remember whose you are? For Joe Kelly, we all belong to Jesus Christ. And no matter where you had come from or what you had accomplished, what you had succeeded at or what you had failed at, you belonged to Jesus Christ. And it was important for him to remind us of that. But it was his third question that I loved going to committee meetings where I knew Joe Kelly would be present, whether it was a finance committee meeting or a board of trustees or the administrative council or administrative board. We Methodists are not sure if we've got a council or a board or what it is. Joe Kelly would listen to the presentation. He would ask pertinent questions, but then he would get to the Joe Kelly question, and it was this. What is the bottom line? What is the bottom line? Can you answer that? In terms of your spiritual life, in terms of your walk, in terms of your faith, what is the bottom line? What for you are the non-negotiables, or what is for you the non-negotiable? The rabbi Nicodemus comes and visits the rabbi Jesus at night. Don't read too much into that because that's when rabbis discuss theology with each other at night. Rabbi, Nicodemus said, we know you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Nicodemus is very comfortably and very gently inviting Jesus into a discussion of himself and his ministry. Nicodemus wants to know about Jesus, and Jesus cuts to the bottom line, as it were. Nicodemus, Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. The Greek says in a couple of places, without being born again. Nicodemus said, how's that possible? Can you enter into your mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus said, nobody can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water in the Spirit that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. Nicodemus, 
It's not enough to know about me, Jesus is saying. You need to experience personally my love, my grace. You need to experience personally what happens to you when I enter into your life, when you are transformed, when you are changed by this gospel that I've been proclaiming. Nicodemus, it's not enough to know about Jesus. You need to know Jesus. So for 20 weeks, we've been reading passages of Scripture about Jesus, about His life, His ministry, His teachings, His miracles. We've read the Passion story about His last week in Jerusalem. We've read the story of the resurrection and the story of the formation and the power of the early church. We've read it in the hopes not that you would learn more about Jesus, but that you would know Jesus, that your relationship with him would be deepened, that your relationship with him would become more real and more precious. In the third chapter of the book of Exodus, you read the story of the call of Moses to go back to lead the Hebrews out of Egypt. And Moses does what most of us would do when we are called to great endeavor. Moses starts crawfishing. He starts listing his excuses. And he finally gets down to one excuse that's pertinent. He says, well, bottom line, who are you that's sending me? I want to know your name. And God answers him with a Hebrew word that is almost untranslatable. He says, yit yay. We pronounce it Yahweh. God says in giving Moses that Hebrew verb to be for his name, I am who I am. I am what I am. I cause to be that which I cause to be. I was what I was. I will be what I will be. It's a concept of God that, that can't be contained in, in human form, in human intellect. God was saying to Moses, I'm larger than you are. I'm bigger than you are. I'm more glorious than you can imagine. I'm the one that's called you. And Yahweh became the covenant name to God, a name so holy it was only pronounced once a year on the Day of Atonement by the high priest in the temple, a name so holy that even in Scripture now, when the Hebrews translate the word, the word G-D appears because the name of God is so holy. And in the third, or in the Gospel of John, Jesus adopts and adapts this I am phrase to describe his life and his ministry to his people. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I'm that which you need day by day to sustain you. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus said, I am that bread. I am what you need each and every day. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. People have walked in darkness. But I've come to bring life so you can, might see yourself as you really am. You might see yourself as God really sees you. And you might see the world as it really is. And you can walk in the light. Then he says, I'm the door. I'm the door to the sheep's pen. I'm the door of protection. I'm the door of the fold that allows you to come in, that allows you to be safe, that allows you to belong. And I'm the good shepherd. That is an oxymoronic statement of Jesus because in that time, shepherds were not considered good. They were considered as those who lived on the cusp of the law. Jesus said one time, which of you have a, having a hundred sheep, sheep will lose one, will leave the 99 and go after the one? And the answer is none of them would do that. If they had a hundred sheep 
and they lost one, they would go to the next herd and steal a sheep from that shepherd so they would have a hundred sheep. Jesus says, as the good shepherd, no, I'm going to leave the 99 and I'm going to follow and find the one sheep, the one lost lamb. And because Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, we can be assured that none of us, none of us are forgotten by God, abandoned by God, or left by God. He is out searching for us when we turn our backs on him. He tells Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Then in the 14th chapter of John's gospel, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I read that as the great inclusive promise of Scripture. Those words do not exclude anyone. They include the world that God has his arms open wide through Jesus Christ to the whole world that whosoever would come to him He loves and receives and accepts. And then Jesus finally in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John says, I'm the true vine. You're the branches. I'm the vine. I'm the one. I'm the one that sustains you and gives you strength and gives you life. Jesus, in saying these I am statements, is painting a picture of himself as a unique Savior, as a unique opportunity and way to God. You and I are still living with the vestiges of that Methodist advertising slogan, our hearts, our minds, our doors are open. It arose out of a great desire to be seen and understood and experienced as open-minded Christians, as though tolerance is some great and noble virtue. But Wesleyan theology and our, our heritage as Wesleyan Christians has that note of patience and tolerance in our, our theological DNA John Wesley said, if your heart is right, then give me your hand. By the right heart, John Wesley meant you believe in orthodox Christianity. You believe in original sin. You believe in justification by faith. You believe in the new birth. You believe in inward and outward holiness because those were hallmarks of this movement that John Wesley started. That's the DNA that is in the Methodist church. In my life in Methodism, I've been around folks and made dogmatic statements. And I've seen the subtle pursing of the lips and the barely imperceptible shaking of the head. And the message was sent. In this crowd, you must have an open mind. In this crowd, you must accept a broad expanse of theological ideas and constructs and concepts. Being dogmatic and having strongly held views is not acceptable. But since I'm preaching a sermon entitled The Bottom Line, I want to make my case this morning for a closed mind. An ever-open mind is like an ever-open drain. A lot of rubbish can pass through both. And if our Christian faith is a race, as both Paul and the writer of Hebrews likens this life to a race, a race must have a clear goal. A race must have a clearly defined course. A race must have a definitive direction. Can you imagine at Talladega if one Yahoo decided to drive fast and turn right, what would happen? Your GPS guides you based on a fixed point, based on a program destination. While you can take detours, that nice voice will always tell you that she is recalculating 
to get you back on your journey's track. The bottom line, the non-negotiables, the things I have a closed mind about are all related to my faith in Christ. These matters are settled. They're settled in Scripture. They're settled by church tradition. I believe in God. I believe in the love of God. I believe in the trustworthiness of Christ, that He is the authentic Word of the Father, that He lived, He died, He physically rose again. I believe his words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I believe in the divinely inspired Word of God, the Bible. Like John Wesley, I am a man of the book. I believe in mercy. And I believe in judgment. These are not opinions with me. These are my non-negotiables. These are my bottom line beliefs. Call me dogmatic, if you will, but I'm on a perilous journey. And I would be a fool to doubt the one who is the pioneer and perfecter of my faith, Jesus Christ. What's your bottom line? What are your non-negotiables. Do you live out of them? And when Jesus is your bottom line, your pronoun comes alive. Your pronoun comes alive. Boy, have we been having fun with pronouns in our culture. Such a simple thing back when I was in the third grade, no longer so. I want to argue that our pronouns are important for our non-negotiables. We need to know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. You need to be able to say, He is my Lord. He is my Savior. It's not enough to know about Him. We need to know Him personally. It's getting me into the cross that changes lives. It was true for many of our heroes of the faith. Take Martin Luther. Early in his years, he was a rigid Roman monk. He laboriously was working to his passage into heaven by midnight vigils, by flagellations, by fasting, and still never feeling that his sins were forgiven until the day when the pronouns came alive for him and he cried, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Luther wrote in his commentary on Galatians years later, Read therefore with great vehemency these words, Me and for me, and so inwardly practice with yourself that you with a sure faith may conceive and print this Me in your heart and apply it to yourself, not doubting you are of the number of those to whom this Me belongs." Luther was saying, Christ died for me. He gave his life for me. It was the same for John Wesley. Whatever happened on Aldersgate Street on May 24th, 1738, there's no questions but that the pronouns came alive. He says himself, an assurance was given me that he has taken away my sins, even mine, and save me from the law of sin and death. Or his brother Charles, who had a similar experience to David two or two before John, the me came into his heart suddenly, and Charles Wesley cried and wrote words that are still in our hymnal. I felt the Lord's atoning blood close to my soul applied, Me, me he loved, the Son of God, for me, for me he died. For me it's a non-negotiable and it's a bottom line, the bottom line. Jesus Christ is my Lord. And Jesus Christ is my Savior. 
for you? What's the bottom line that you live out of? What's the foundation upon which you stand? Is it the Lord Jesus? Would you stand and pray with me? We thank you for the promise that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that through you all people can come to the Father. We thank you as the great I Am that you have come to us in the person of Jesus. And in this time, in this place, our prayer is let us know more of Jesus. Let us know him and serve him and follow him as our Lord and Savior. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn together. in the paths of peace, patience to outlast the troubles of the day, joy that radiates from the inside out, and love that erases barriers and heals the wound. God go with you this day and forevermore. Amen.
You've been watching the live broadcast from Trinity United Methodist Church in Ruston, Louisiana. I'm Reverend Doug DeGraffenreed, and I want to thank you for choosing to be a part of our worshiping community today. Our prayer is that God has used this time to speak specifically to you, wherever you are on your faith journey. At Trinity, our goal is to help you live into a deeper relationship with Jesus and reach wider in serving the world He loves. For more information about how you can live deeper and reach wider, visit us online at trinityruston.org and let us know how we can help you reach the next step of your walk with Christ. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to seeing you soon.